Welcome to the Uncomfortable Ministry, I guess you could say a podcast, for we're not recording live, but um, I do want to um, begin, I believe, a very um, in-your-face, matter-of-fact, do-something-about-it-right-now series titled Looking, Looking. And so I, I, I want to be clear about where this particular message in the series have kind of culminated to come to this place where we actually would record uh, three different parts to this. I truly believe that when we look at our lives and we look at what's going on and everything that's happening and when we put it all in a mixing bowl and, or, and um, we, we put a mirror up to it and we, we kind of come to the place if we're really, really honest with ourselves, if we're really, really honest about um, others, if we're really, really honest about our world, if we're really, really honest about um, our, our, our engagement with God, if we're really, really honest about our lack of empathy, the darkness of our world, if we're really, really honest about all those things, I think we come to a place as a people that it's not some super deep functionality of causation as to why this might be. When we pick apart the equation of how and why and where we are and how we got there and why we are there, I think what we find is that we're all looking for something to fulfill the things that we are yearning for. And the problem with that is that we're looking in places, we're looking in all of the wrong places for all of the wrong things, for all of the wrong reasons, when we have the exact place, the exact person, the exi- for the exact reasoning that's been around since the beginning of time. And we have this con- crescendo, this, this climactic eruption that is depression, depression, that is anger, disappointment. And what we don't realize is that there is a true reasoning to this. There's a reason to why this is, why we search and why we yearn for things in areas that cannot fulfill. And there is Uh, not just a hope, but an actual thing that we've received that fixes all of that. And there is more to come. And so in this particular series, that's how this series is broken up. We're going to talk about today what we lost. And I want to kind of put our fingers on what it is that we're probably searching for and searching for in the wrong places. And then next week, the next part of this series, we're going to talk about what we got. And then obviously following that, what we will be getting. And I think at the end, or maybe in the middle, maybe in the beginning, either one of these particular parts, there's going to be some realization in your life. The Lord is going to move in a mighty way and he's going to bring you to this realization that your efforts in searching for things that cannot sustain you is futile. And so um, let's jump right into it. Our base scripture that we're going to base this entire um, series 
on is found in one of the epistles that Paul wrote um, to the church at Colossae. And so it's found in Colossians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 20. And so this is our anchor verse, but however, each each part of the series will have um, their own unique text of what we're going to try to bring out specifically in those particular parts. And so, but our anchor and our main verse of this particular series is Colossians, the 15th, cha- I'm sorry, the first chapter, verses 15 through 20. I want to read it and then I want to dive right into our first part of our looking series. Verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in verse 20 and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. Now there's a lot there. And at some point we're going to tackle all of that. And, uh, as we get in the other parts of this series, but in your personal study, after this particular message, when you go back, I want you to underline everywhere it has all or everything or first, um, I want you to underline that in your Bible. You may have that this particular scripture highlighted, um, but I want you to underline wherever, wherever you see everything or all or first. Now, turn your Bibles to Genesis. We're going all the way back to the beginning. Genesis, the third chapter. And we're going to read um, several parts of this, but we're going to focus on Probably, um, uh, we're going to read, we'll start with verse one. How about we start with verse one and we just work our way up to verse six, cause that's, uh, verse six, seven and eight. Um, and then so on and so forth. And that will be where we're going to kind of unpack this particular part of the series of looking. And so before I read that, I want to pray for our time and then I'll read it. And then I'll give you the title of this particular part of the series of looking, and then we'll jump right into this. Father, we thank you so much as always, God, you're so good to us. And we thank you because we get to study and talk and preach and listen and cry about and pray about and have joy about your word. And we thank you, Father. We give you honor. We give you glory for our lives mean absolutely nothing if you don't put purpose to it. And so, Lord, we thank you that you've given us those things. Lord, we thank you more important than anything for our salvation, which is given to us through grace, freely, through Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb who died for our sins, who was buried and rose again. And so, Lord, today that um, as we study um, from the original, origins of what we lost with you in paradise to how you're coming back again for us all and everything in between god thank you so much that you would love us enough that you would be willing to reconcile with us and so lord today 
We pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say. Lord, I personally ask that you would just remove me and insert yourself. Let your word be spoken. Holy Spirit, your power will go forth. Jesus, help us to understand what you're saying to us today. It's in your name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis, the third chapter, and I'm going to begin at the first verse. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. We all know this particular familiar passage of scripture. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. Here's where we get into our message today. Verse four, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I want you to underline was good for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes. I want you to underline delight to the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. I want you to underline desire to make one wise. Or however it reads in your translation. Verse 11. She took of it its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And so in this first part of this series titled Looking, I want to use for a subject what we lost, what we lost. I remember as a kid, I would lose my house keys all the time and I would be in trouble all the time and to be honest i would get whoopings because i was not responsible enough and i kept not being responsible enough to keep up with my door key now i grew up in detroit and i grew up in this particular time um in a very dangerous part of the city and um the thought of most families, definitely my family, definitely my mother was, if you lose that key, now the burglars, the robbers, the murderers, the horrible people of society has access to our home and could get our few things that we have. And so the value of the lost key was extremely high and I never could understand why my mother was so crazy about me losing my key and why it would bring so much pain and that whooping and it would be if I lost my key at school it would just be Armageddon to face my mother but there was a remedy for it. she ended up tying my key around my neck and so from that point on, I had never lost my keys. But the point is not necessarily that. I want us to understand that before you can understand the before you can understand and appreciate finding something, you must realize and understand the value of it being lost and what was lost. And so in this particular series, we're trying to wrap our minds around the notion that we're looking for something in this world that obviously we have yet to find. And I truly believe that the reason why we're looking in all of the wrong places and, and, and looking for all the wrong things in all the wrong places is because we have yet to understand the value and what it is that we lost. 
Thanks be to God that the word of God shows us and helps us understand what it is that we lost in the first sin. It's weird how oftentimes when we talk about Genesis and the first part of Genesis, it's very weird that we kind of go back to our origins in this place. We talk about Adam a little bit and Eve and eating of the fruit. And we talk about God creating heaven and earth, creating the world and everything and let there be light. But for the most part, we don't ever really go back to it as a point of reference. And I'm always baffled at that because whenever I talk about homosexuality and marriage, I always go back to Genesis. It's right there. The blueprint is right there. Whenever I talk about rest and the Sabbath and talk and teach about it, um, it's right there in the text. Of course, there's other confirming and other verses that have weighted value to understanding those particular topics. But we never go back to the origination of when God spoke things into existence and created things into his existence in its original state. And so my mind got blown. I don't know when it was. I don't know exactly where I was, what scripture it was. I mean, what sermon it was, if it was a teaching, I don't know. But something hit me at some point in time many years ago. And I realized, I think I heard it was somebody on TV or something like that. But I realized that we, even in 2020, are still searching for something that we lost back in Genesis. Now, some might say, what are you talking about? You're preaching uh, heresy. Christ came. He finished it. It is all complete. And absolutely, you wouldn't get an argument from me. That is the truth. And it is. And he did. But what we need to understand is that prior and prior to Christ coming and uh, there was a original origination that God had made men in their like image. And we read that in Genesis 1. And there was no reason for Christ to come on the scene until sin entered into our world. And so when you think about a world absent of sin, you think about heaven, you think about paradise. There's only two places. It's in the beginning before Adam ate of the fruit. And Eve ate of the fruit and disobeyed God and heaven, which is to come. And we will get to that in the third part of this series. And so I want us to understand we're not dis discounting uh, Christ's finishing works on the cross as we await as his uh, bride. We'll wait for our bridegroom to come and receive us and take us into eternity with heaven and I mean eternity in with him in heaven but I want us to understand that prior to this what we just read in Genesis 3 there was an order that was aligned perfectly and the sin of disobedience entered and ruined it all and so my brothers and sisters in Christ, yes, Christ has finished the reconciliation of sin. No longer sin can separate us from the father. But there still is a groaning. The Bible talks about and a yearning to be in perfectness with him. We are not yet physically in perfectness with him because we have yet to receive our glorified bodies to be in heaven with him and spend eternity with him. We are still toiling down here on earth. We are still stumbling. We are still sinning. We are still making mistakes. We are still sinning and disobeying God. And so it's important for us to understand this dynamic that pre-Christ, well, I shouldn't say pre-Christ, pre-Christ coming in human flesh on earth was an order that God had. And when even Adam disobeyed God in the garden, we lost something. We got our right standing and reconciliation back through the blood shed of Christ Jesus on Calvary's cross. 
but our flesh has been has become an enmity an enemy of God and there's this invisible war that fights the spirit of God the holy spirit fighting on our behalf fighting the sinful decaying stinky flesh and so the flesh yearns and desires something and the spirit yearns and pulls us and desires into something and what it has created is this gulf this void of parrot of paradise with our father and so what you see in the garden and what happened and what we lost is important for us to understand to this particular day. Because I guarantee whatever it is that you're searching for, whatever it is that you have been yearning for and fighting for and looking in all the wrong places with all the wrong intentions, it could be found in these particular voids, these gulfs, these gaps that I'm going to show you today in our, in our text today. And so let's jump right into it. You can argue with me. You can disagree with me. You can not believe that this is the case. But I just ask that you would open up your heart and your minds and just hear me for a minute. Just hear this. And so when we look at our particular text, I want to read verse six. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate. But let's go back a little bit further. Let's go back to when God has given man the adam given adam this instruction in verse 15 of chapter 2 it says the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to work it and keep it and so we first we uh we must first understand um and, and I'll, i have in my bible i'm looking at this note when i talked about men and woman and when i would do my particular teachings on the different role the different roles of man and woman and how our society is trying to get us to conjoin the roles and and make it okay and make it and and i try to go back to the origination of what god has instructed us and how he has given us our particular roles and defined them and i talk about this particular verse because this is the first role of responsibility and it's given to the man and it says the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eating eaten i'm sorry to work it and keep it and the Lord God commanded the man, he commanded the man, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. I'm giving you a bevy of trees to eat from. These trees will grow fruit. You will have sufficient enough nutrients. Verse 17, but of the tree, of the tree, one. Now, I want us to look at that. Look at verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree. That's plural of every tree, any other tree that is in the garden. But in verse 17, God was specific as to what tree not to eat from. And so he says in verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Many trees one tree clear instruction you can eat of these many trees this one tree you don't eat now the reason why i'm saying that because i want you to begin to to explore your mirror of imagination within yourself and of mankind to understand that it's like mankind to have many options of many things but when we want this one thing that is not good for us, we disregard the many of things in order to seek after the thing that is not good for us. But I'll keep going because that's not the point of this particular message. But I want you to start unraveling this in your mind from that perspective. He says in verse 17, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. 
For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. One of the things that I love about God, if I can just stick a, paw, a pen in this particular moment, is God always gives clear direction. He just doesn't lay down commandments or laws. He gives directions and they're clear. But if you treat it, but if you, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you shall not, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And he goes on to say, man should not be left alone. And he does the rest of the thing that he does. And so he leaves them in the garden. He's given Adam his instruction of what to do. In verse 15, he says to work it and keep it. And I've given you responsibility. I've given you now a helper. I've given you sufficient nutrients to survive. And you have me all the time right here with you. What else would you need? And so we go on and mankind disobeys God and eat of the fruit. And now they've become aware of good and evil. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the reasons why I take this back to Genesis is because I think it's important to understand that this knowledge that you know what's evil and, and that you know what's good and the fact that you desire sometimes the most evilest of things and you have the most evilest of thoughts and sometimes you can have the most good of heart and do some of the most wonderful deeds and it's all happening all at the same time and how you can be aware of it, how you can see something that's not right, that's dirty, that's shady, and how at the same time you can have visual of something that's great and good and talented. It originated in the garden. Our original Adam, the first Adam as the Bible uh, uh, spells it out, when they did this, they became knowledgeable of good and evil. And it's what God didn't want them to become knowledgeable of. In fullness, I can say it this way. It's what God did not originally want us to become knowledgeable of. And so, here we are. The damage has been done. It's been lost. But I want to talk about what we've lost and what we end up gaining in that lost. And it's why you are searching for the stuff that you're searching for in the places you are searching it for. The first point that I want to make is we lost our sufficient dependence and survival. God said that you can eat of every tree in the garden. And I would assume, I don't know, I was not there, but I would assume that he had given them a sufficient amount. Remember, there was no sin at the time and there was sufficient amount of trees to eat from. And so survival was absolutely doable. Survival it wasn't a matter of will it be challenged, will it be in, or will it, will it will survival be ended? Survival was a thing. It was just, it was. And so we lost our sufficient dependence on survival. The reason why I know is because it says in verse six, it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And so when she ate of the fruit, she began to seek something else for survival, for food that God said not to. And so enter into our world, enter into the Genesis times, enter, in, enter into the day that you were born, enter into the world of 2020 in December is our push 
to create our own survival. That's what I'm trying to say when I say our, that we lost our sufficient dependence and survival. We lost the ability to be satisfied, to be completely sufficient enough with the survival that God provides. And so ever since the Genesis time, ever since the fall of man, the Bible is clear of men and the people of Israel and his chosen people and all the other people attempting to create survival on their own, all, in, all while finding themselves to fall back and need God. Does that sound familiar to you? We seek to search in areas that we have no business to searching, putting our faith and our trust in idolatry of things and people and places of our current day, only to learn that it is unsustainable, that it does not have the type of substance that can hold us, keep us, move us, change us, uplift us, promote us, and we only find ourselves back on our knees, falling and asking for help from God. And so we lost our sufficient dependence and survival. And what we garnered is this urge, this desire to fix, to find it ourselves. And you would see that as you read on. But let me go to my second point. We lost our sufficient dependence and survival. We also lost our sufficient dependence and satisfaction. God had satisfied us. Not only did he put enough trees in the garden for us to eat from, to survive. And I say us because we are part of them. And he, we could even fast forward to current day. God has put enough on earth for us to chew on his word of God. He's put enough on, uh, on earth for us to put our hands to, to do the work of the God, of the work of the Lord, that we don't have to engage into the, the negativity and the sinfulness and the downtrodden and the darkness and the evil that we trifle in. And so God had given us enough sufficient trees to survive. But here it is in verse six, it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes, God had given them multiple trees to gaze upon, to see the fruit that will, that will promote their survival. That was sufficient enough for their survival to do what it is that he called them to do, which was to work and keep the garden but not only that he himself was there with them it's a shame when god provides something for us to survive on which is sufficient enough in itself but he also gives himself to us and it still not be something and our eyes can still be distracted and attracted to something else. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, what happened in this garden is we lost our sufficient dependency and survival, but we lost our sufficient dependency when they ate of the fruit in satisfaction and being satisfied with what God is, who he is and what he provides. And so what you find in 2020 and any other year and even years to come is us searching, looking, striving, struggling, stumbling, stressed out, losing our hair, losing our health, losing our families, trying to find that same satisfaction to the eyes that was only for God in the presence of the garden and the trees that he had given us for survival. And so probably perhaps why you are failing and why you are finding no sufficient insufficiency in what it is that you are opening up the lid to look in, to find you, to find your purpose, to find your way, to find your identity is because you're looking in a place where God isn't. 
You're looking in the place where God has not provided his sufficient enough blessings in order for you to discover the answer. And so like Eve looking and gazing upon the tree that God had already instructed for her not to even take and eat, there was no need to even look at it because you weren't going to, you want to, you were not going to engage with it. You were not going to taste it. You were not going to try it. You needed to stay a far, far away from it as possible, but somehow, some way she allowed the enemy to trick her to think that there was some other satisfaction other than what God had provided, including himself. And so not only did we lose our sufficient dependence and survival, and not only did we lose our sufficient uh, dependence and satisfaction, but we lost our sufficient dependency in submitting. It's right there in the text in verse six. He says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Do you know submission by definition is to give authority to something that perhaps have more knowledge and authority in an area or in a thing than you have. And so when you desire something because it can make you wise, a red flag ought to go off. There will be sounding alarms because our true, true origination in paradise, pre-sin, pre-human Christ on earth, coming to earth to die for our sins, to reconcile and justify us, we had a submitting dependency that was sufficient enough to God. And so whatever we were to receive, whatever we were to have, whatever our directions needed to be was from God. If you read the previous chapter in two and one, you can see God clearly making the case for that everything that you need will come from me. And somehow, some way, Eve and Adam were tricked into seeing that this particular tree that they had been forbidden, commanded not to take part in, was somehow, some way, had somehow given off, at least in their minds, wisdom that they didn't already have in the sufficiency of God being in the garden with them. I want you to think about that. What is it that is in your life that you are looking to to give you meaning of life that you feel as though that this would make me so wise and give me so much wisdom to the point where the desiring of what God has and his wisdom and his word of God falls to second place in comparison. And so we wonder why we are exhausted and tired and angry and tribal, lacking empathy, lacking compassion, because we all are walking into brick walls looking for something that is already sufficient enough that's right here for the taking. And so what we've garnered when we've lost our sufficient dependency in survival and satisfaction and submitting. When we continue reading, we look at verse seven, it says, then the eyes of the both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sold fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so what we've tried to do is hide 
our shame. We went from sufficiency in the garden to hiding our shame. And so re the, one of the reasons why we searching and we yearning and we run ourselves ragged, looking for purpose in all the wrong pla places and looking for identity in all the wrong places and looking for some type of promotion in all the wrong places is because we are in trying to hide the embarrassment that of shame that we don't have it. That's what Adam and Eve did. And then the other thing is in verse eight, it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And also we lost our sufficiency, dependency and survival satisfaction submitting. And the other thing that we garnered is this creative mind to be deceptive to deceive how can you think that you can hide from the one who created the garden and put you in the garden but what happened in this place in this moment in this disobedience in this in this entering of sin this fall of man this disobeying god is we develop this creativity to try to trick and deceive God. And when we can't trick and deceive God, we trick and deceive one another. Does that sound familiar in the world that you live in today? The other thing that we garnered when we lost our sufficiency and dependence and survival satisfaction submitting is the immediacy to blame somebody else. Get that off of me. And we know how this plans out in the 12th and 13th verse. It says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be my with me, I'm sorry, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. In verse 13, it says, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. God was clear when he gave the commandment to not eat of the tree. Yes, the serpent was crafty than any other beast and he is who he is. But God gave you the commandment, Eve, Adam. My brothers and sisters in Christ, can I just say to you, God gave you the commandment. Yes, the enemy and all of his schemes and all of his demons and all of his, his uh, dark angels, all of them are at you all the time. Absolutely. But God gave you his word, his commandment, his direction. And so we, we garnered this immediacy to blame. And that's why we lie. And that's why when we don't find what it is that we're looking for and when we don't succeed in the areas that we thought we should have succeeded in when God does not open the doors that we think he should open for our own self-satisfaction and for our own self-indulgement and self-involved and, and, and self-absorbed, I should say, and for our own glory, we blame him. We blame the man. We blame the dysfunction of my family. We blame the dysfunction of this. We blame neighborhoods. We blame the system. And so, as I close, as we start this particular series titled Looking, my challenge to all of us is to go back to Genesis 3. As a matter of fact, start in Genesis 1 and keep reading and understand that the sufficiency is what we lost. And even though Christ is in his fullness, as we read in Colossians, God is pleased with God 
himself, his fullness being directly into inside the body of his son, Jesus. He is everything that we lost. And he's here and he's for the taking. And you can get him now. You can ask him to come into your life. And Lord, let me live for you. Let you be my all sufficiency in everything. My total dependence of survival, of satisfaction, of submitting. Remove the embarrassment, the, 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 the desire to cover up my shame so I won't be embarrassed. Remove this creativity to deceive and to be deceptive to you. Remove this immediacy to blame somebody else other than myself when I have yet to follow your precepts and your grace and your mercy and your word. Jesus, come into my life. And fix what was lost in the Garden of Eden. My brothers and sisters, I pray for us in this moment, this time, that we will understand that the value of what you lost is not found in the material or tangible things that this world has to offer. The value in what you lost is found in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much that even though we lost something great in the Garden of Eden, You put it all what we lost within yourself and you freely give it to us. God, thank you for being our full survival. Thank you for being our full satisfaction. Thank you for being our full submission. God, help someone today. <laughs> As a matter of fact, start with me. Help me today, God, to find my total sufficiency and dependence upon you and nothing else. So that I won't waste any more time so that the people who are hearing this message won't waste any more time looking in places that have nothing to offer them. Jesus, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for being our full sufficiency. <laughs>